So here's another layer that kind of adds to the foregone about how to love the battle of integration. Because you got, if, if you learn to love the process, then it doesn't matter if you win or lose. You just want to do the process. Like, we all enjoy eating. That's a process. It does have a beginning, and it does have an end. But you, n nobody says, okay, I've eaten once, and I never have to eat again. Okay? And yeah, maybe you eat because you're hungry, but a lot of our motive for eating is because it tastes good. Okay, so what's going to make the battle for integration taste good? To God, it tastes good. So then it must really, truly taste good. We just haven't, as it were, grown up enough to have grown up tastes like God's. And so spiritual maturation can be classified or characterized as growing up in God's tastes. Now, David talks about that. Taste the Lord, for he is good. And there's even some pickles. I need to go to the store and get them. Called batamt. It means tasty in Hebrew, supposedly in Hebrew. It's got to be modern Hebrew. Okay? And they're really good pickles, okay? They make really good herring, too. Okay? Don't talk to me about gefilte fish. I hate gefilte fish. If I ever even see gefilte fish again in my lifetime, I will vomit. Okay. Those are about taste, aren't they? Some people obviously adore gefilte fish. Have you ever looked at gefilte fish? It's just white fish. But I don't know who got the idea that it would be a smart thing to jelly it and jar it. It looks like preserved innards. It's the most disgusting, off-white that you can imagine. Okay? I don't know how come Jews like that. Salmon locks, I mean, yeah. Gefilte fish? Have some gefilte fish? No. Okay, but those are tastes. Thank God he doesn't like gefilte fish. Or... Maybe he does. Whatever it is he likes, this process of battling for integration is it, baby, because that's his whole lifestyle. That's what he's doing. If you want to know what God is doing right now, he's battling for integration. In your soul, in my soul, in the soul of everybody else. And he's going to be doing that same thing a billion years from now. He's battling against himself. He's battling for the Son. He's battling for the Spirit. The Son is battling against himself and for Father and for the Spirit. And the Spirit is battling against himself and for Father and for Son. And frankly, at the risk of losing my audience, there's a lot of terminology in the Bible which, not to put too fine a point on it, likens this process to uh, intercourse. There, I said it. I said it fast. You can, you know, figure out what kind on your own. Paul got that. Paul's frequent theme, and you can't see it in the English because they bland it out, is exactly that. That you're making love to God by learning His Word. And you get pregnant <laughs> with Christ <laughs> as a result. And that's why he says, like in Galatians 4.19, I'm sweating you out until Christ is born in you. My pastor had a field day with that verse. My pastor was the one who talked about this particular subject almost, you know, well, often enough that I remember. So, to God, the battle of integration is like making love, which kind of helps you understand why he designed the love-making process to be the way it is, because it's a lot of huff and puff with a little, some kind of, you know, ooh at the end. I don't exactly remember. It's been a very long time. 40 years, 50 years, 40 years. Mm-hmm. 
a little less than 40 years. I think maybe 35. So my memory's kind of old. But that's what I remember. A lot of huff and puff. And then a little woo at the end. Okay? And he invented that process. He invented it. So God is not, uh, what do you want to call it? Dour and sour and, you know, prissy. He invented sex. Himself invented it. So what do you think that means? He invented sex. He invented marriage. And he invented sex in marriage. Nowhere else. And the marriage that he invented is between a man and a woman. Now, just because you might be gay doesn't mean you can't be saved. But, you know, and I, whether or not there's some state law that allows for gay marriage or not, or allows for sodomy or not, God says sodomy is a sin. Being gay isn't necessarily a sin. Sodomy is a sin. Okay, I'm not gay. I'm heterosexual. If I go out and do something with some guy, it's a sin. So, you know, you it's like one person's kind of sin versus another person's kind of sin. It's sin either way. Sex is only okay in marriage between a man and a woman. Okay? The Bible doesn't put a stigma on being gay the way people do. In other words, if you did it and you're gay with another gay person, that's a sin. If I did it with a heterosexual, you know, because I'm female, with a male, it would be a sin also. Okay, and that's all. That's it. They're, they're both sins. The only kind of sex that's okay is between a man and a woman who are married to each other. Otherwise, it's all wrong. Any kind. Doing it to yourself, doing it with an animal, doing it with somebody of the opposite sex, doing it with somebody of the same sex. It's all illicit. No particular distinction is given. One version versus another. Okay. Now. That whole statement tells you a whole lot about this battle of integration. Because God is likening it to lovemaking. Okay, but God doesn't have a body. So it's not sexual. But it's got the same idea behind it. The idea behind sex is intimacy and closeness with one person forever on this earth. Not multiple partners, just one. See, marriage, male, female, opposites. God is God nature, you're human nature. That's opposite of God's nature. And there's only one God, and there's only you. Not multiple gods. And when I say only one God, I mean only one Father, only one Son, only one Spirit. And they themselves organize themselves in a hierarchy. So when you pray, you don't pray to Jesus, and you don't pray to the Holy Spirit. You pray only to Father. And you'll sometimes, and you'll see Paul do this, or some of the New Testament writers do this, you'll sometimes be talking to Jesus as a conversation, not as a prayer. Prayer only goes to Father. As a conversation, you might say something to Christ, you might say something to the Holy Spirit. But generally speaking, it's Father. Okay? So there's a certain oneness there because there's a hierarchy. They themselves choose to be in a hierarchical office, as it were, relationship to each other. You've got mother, father, son. Okay? And in a family, it's hierarchical. So you've got mom and dad and the kids. They're one family, but they've, they're separate persons. Okay? So similarly, in a marriage, you got one man and one woman together united, and so God made the bodies so that they fit as if one person. It's a sexual analogy being made there at the end. The two shall become one at the end of Genesis 2. Okay? So that analogy is between you and God. Between God and you. 
exclusive. So there's a kind of lovemaking. So there's a kind of intimacy. So there's a kind of battle for integration because, as any husband and wife can tell you, there's a lot of compromises that go on in a marriage. And when I mean compromise, I mean in a nice way. Husband likes something that wife doesn't like, so wife tries to like it to accommodate her husband. Husband doesn't like something his wife likes, but he tries to like it to accommodate her. And even if he doesn't like it, he'll accommodate her anyway. Okay, well, now look. God likes something we don't. We call it obedience. And when you're five years old spiritually, you'll stress that. But that's not really what it's about. It's about oneness. God likes X, Y, and Z, and we don't. God likes what he likes, and then he calls it good, and then what he doesn't like, he calls bad or sin. Because that's its real nature. Of course, he created it. And you say, well, God created bad things? Of course he did. He even says so. Isaiah 45, 7. Freedom means to create something that's free to go wrong. And then there are other things that, on the surface, are unpleasant that he created that aren't really sin themselves at all. P, defecation, we don't like those things. They're essential to your living. And in the ancient times, they used to collect it. They used urine for cleaning, and they used um, defecation for, um, you know, fuel. To cook. I can't even imagine. They must have poured lye or something on it so it wouldn't stink. They used to collect it. And one of the big issues in the Mosaic Law was not to use human dung. To use animal dung, yes, for cooking, but not human. I don't know why that law was there. I haven't studied it enough. But the point is, is that God makes these laws or rules, and he calls them laws, and he calls them rules, but when you get older, you, you realize, well, well, first of all, he's doing it to give us you a happy life. Because you don't even know straight up from straight down. I mean, the, home, the whole human race is very childish. So the Old Testament has a lot of really childish rules in them, which tells you that the people were of like a kindergarten mentality, even when they were adults. They were very childish. So he had to, you know, you can do this and you can't do that. And apparently people still are childish because they think that if they obey the Ten Commandments that they're really good Christians today. The Ten Commandments are like for babies. It's not that they become obsolete, but hello, it, it, once you learn God, you don't want to do those things anyhow. You know, the prohibitions and the things that are positive commands, you want to do them anyway. You don't need to have a command on the books telling you to do this or don't do that, because that's already your desire when you're maturing. When you're not maturing, you give yourself little gold stars, because all the things God says don't do, you want to do. And all the things he says to do, you don't want to do. As you mature, you naturally don't want to do what you shouldn't do. Now, the biggest thing to take away from this is that if it's like lovemaking, that's a real strong reason to want the battle. If you like lovemaking, and the battle and the lovemaking are all internal inside your head, bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. You want to do that. You won't be doing it 
Okay, it won't happen. And then you'll, like, you know, you'll go by an hour, two hours, ten hours, ten days. <clears throat> and you realize, wow, I could have been thinking toward God. I could have been getting Bible doctrine out of my daily activity. Using Bible doctrine on what I do every day. But instead, I was just thinking horizontally like the rest of the human race. What a waste of time. In the beginning, when you're thinking horizontally, the idea of applying Bible doctrine is not pleasant to you. And you have to credit yourself as being a good person if you do it. But once you're mature, it's like, wow, this is a far better way to live. And then you catch yourself going an hour or two looking at something else and not connecting it to God at all. Not connecting it to the Bible at all. And you're like, wow, no wonder I'm tired. I wasted my time. It's a happier way to live, to live vertically toward God. But until you got enough Bible in you that it's like almost a natural part of your whole thinking, and you'll know it's a natural part of your thinking, if every time you look at something or think about something, there's a like an instinct, a question, well, what does God say about this? What does the Bible say about this? Or it reminds you of the Bible in some way. Once that starts to become a habit, people will actually notice They'll tell you. You might not be aware of it when it happens. Then you know, oh, gee, I really am maturing in Christ. Because <clears throat> it becomes so natural. And once it does, you start to realize that, oh, you know, the life you used to live when you didn't have all those connections was not so good. But until that happens, you'll be doing it because you think you're supposed to. So here's my suggestion. Just ask God to remind you of Bible. Just ask him to remind you. Because i got to tell you, that was kind of what started this whole audio for me. So I was thinking about how happy I was once I started knowing he was hitting me with stuff. You know that verse... And it says, to will and to do. God works in you to will and to do. It's in Philippians. I'm not sure where I want to say it's in Philippians 2. But it might not be there. God works in you to will and to do. Okay, but knowing it's Him doing it, and not your own thought, is shocking at times upsetting and nerve-wracking because you it's it's direct I, I it's more it's stronger than like seeing him face to face because you 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 know that the thought that's hitting you is coming from him it's definite it's not a voice, and it's not, it's not here. You just know that it's him, and this is what he, what he communicates. He communicates through thought, and he uses doctrine when he does it, as you can see, because he's interrupt, he interrupts me when I'm talking in these things now. That didn't used to happen. It started happening in April, first week of April, which is my pastor's birthday was April 1. And it might have been on April 1, but I don't think so. Um, April 2. It was on April 2. Yeah. April 2, 1998 is when it first started happening to me. When I first started recognizing that a thought that would hit came from him. The very first time I knew it came from the Holy Spirit. And I had asked the question of God, and I got an immediate answer. And I knew it was an answer. And it was a question about something going on in my day that day. It wasn't about Bible. And from that point forward, I started to be able to discern the difference between me thinking and just doctrine flowing in my head and him actually... Okay. 
Now, I'm not the only one that's happened to. Over the years, I run into a whole lot of other people who describe the same process not knowing that it happened to me. And it was, it's a similar thing. They know it came from him. And they don't describe it as God's voice or a vision or a revelation or any of that claptrap you see on YouTube where people are always constantly claiming they got some revelation from God or God put it on my heart. Whenever you hear that kind of language, okay, just walk away from the person because they're trying to brag about it. They're thinking that this is some kind of special thing that marks them as a special Christian versus another Christian. No, it's the norm. This is supposed to happen to everybody. To sit there and brag about God communicating to you as if you were somehow better because God talked to you is proof that uh, it wasn't God who talked to you. Because the norm is supposed to be the Holy Spirit talking to you all the time. And where do you find that? John fourteen twenty six and a thousand other examples in the Old Testament. It was a command in Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 30. And Paul plays on that in Romans 10. The word is in your mouth and in your heart. The word is in your mouth and you memorized it. So why don't you believe it? And of course, God also hired all those prophets to walk around saying, God says the Lord. Well, how did they know what God said if he didn't talk to them? And people will say, people tend to make, you know, the, the Bible people, the people mentioned in the Bible, people today tend to regard those people mentioned in the Bible as somehow special and different. And therefore, if you get the word from God, you're special and different. No. It's supposed to work that way. They got the written word. And at first in their lifetime, some prophet was sent who spoke it to them to. And then he wrote it down to for later generations. And in later generations, more prophets came around. And then finally, the son came. That's what Hebrews is talking about in the first couple of verses of the book of Hebrews in the first chapter. In various ways and at different times, God spoke through the prophets. Okay, but now the word is going to be completed with John. Of course, they, did, you know, they weren't sure yet. The guy who wrote the book of Hebrews didn't say that it was over yet, but that it was going to be. And in the latter days, he, called, he speaks through his son. Yeah, body of Christ, we're part of the son now. Get the point? Canon is closed, but God's revelation, which still goes through canon, is applied using the canon straight to your head. John fourteen twenty six. Through the pastor. Ephesians four sixteen. So there's no Pope adding to the Bible. Bible's already completed. That's in Revelation 22. It says, if anybody adds to this book. Okay, but if God is using the book to interpret its meaning to you inside your head, that's not adding to the book. That's the only way you're even going to understand the book. And he does it to the pastor who passes it on to the congregation. And then when the congregation is studying what the pastor said and turning it over and talking to God about what it is, well, guess what? The Holy Spirit, John fourteen twenty six, will recall to your mind. Well, what's part of recall? Understanding what the recall means. You see what I'm getting at here? Every single Christian... 
when you're using 1 John 1 9, learning and living on Bible under your right teacher, you will have direct communication from God about your life, your day, your everything. Bible class, talk back to Him, and He gives you answers, and that's the way it's supposed to go. Just like any intimate relationship, just like any marriage. Intercourse. Here we're talking social intercourse. Here we're talking talking intercourse. Bidirectional communication between God and you. That's the way it's supposed to be for every Christian. So it's not special. It is a stage though. Because like I said, it wasn't until April 2nd of 1998 that I knew I mean, there were other times prior to that that I knew what God's will was, but that was, from that moment on, it started to become more and more frequent when I knew he was throwing an idea, a thought, a meaning, a command, an interpretation at me. In my head. I knew it was him. And sometimes it's not the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I know when it's Father or Son or the Spirit. Sometimes I don't know which one. The Holy Spirit's the agent of the communication. But sometimes He speaks for one of the other two. And the Bible has verses where you can tell God is interrupting. So it's not... The, the pattern of this is a lot like the way it works in Scripture. But it doesn't happen until you have enough Scripture in your belt under your belt or it doesn't happen frequently until you got a lot of scripture under your belt because God uses scripture to do this communication that's what for Hebrews 1 says when it says he's talking through his son that means he's talking through the word of God you know 1 Corinthians 2 16 defined Bible as the son's thinking and then 1 Corinthians 13 elaborated on that. Okay. So God, the Holy Spirit, will indeed recall it to mind. But He uses Scripture to do it. And you've seen how He does it with me. He might do it a little differently with you depending upon your knowledge of the Bible. But He'll definitely be using biblical ideas. And you'll always be able, and you should, you'll always be able to verify whether that really came from him or not. Now, prior to that time, he works in you to will and to do. Still, that's another verse on the same idea. But you won't necessarily know it's him. You should always use 1 John 1 9, talk to God all the time, and ask. Because he will bring the right ideas to your mind. But the, the, the point of this audio was to say that he does that and you get started in it early. Especially if you get started in it early. But one of the joys of the battle for integration <clears throat> is when you get to the place where you know the doctrine so well. And you're used to this back and forth with him so much that he can, as it were, pull back the onion a little more and just shoot it at you. It's very intense. I remember back in 98 when I first realized that it was him doing it. I was freaked out. I could tell the difference between a thought coming from him directly and an idea that might have actually been from him but seemed to be part of me it was it's it was it was freak it freaked me out for a good month or two and i only survived it by talking to him all the time till i got used to it and now i'm used to it so much so that it's kind of embarrassing because if I'm like in public and shopping or something and I know that there's a, a thought or I have a question, I just might ask him without realizing I'm in public now and I can't talk out loud. 
okay it's kind of embarrassing I've been I've had people look at me sometimes and I just told them I said I'm praying because technically talking to God is prayer right and, oh okay <laughs> one lady really liked that I remember I was looking at some cilantro and I started to talk to God about the cilantro and forgot that there was anybody around me and she looked at me I said oh, I was just praying <laughs> She liked that answer. <laughs> so you see, there's an occupational hazard with it. But notice, that's one of the joys of the battle of integration. <laughs> Forty years, practically, of not knowing that, you know, him just sending a thought directly. I mean, there are times that I knew what he wanted, but they weren't frequent like this. And now all of a sudden, bam, 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 bam. Every day, every day, every day. And that's why I started writing all those web pages. Because on April of 2000, which is two years later, first week of April might have been on April 1. By April 5th, I bought the software, so it was somewhere in there. The janitor named Jesus gave me the computer that he had kept for two weeks waiting to see me. And that was my first Windows computer that, well... It wasn't my first Windows computer, but the Windows computer I had, I never used. I think I used it once to see what it looked like, and I didn't like it, so I went back to DOS. But that was my first Windows computer. It was Windows 95 that the guy was trying to convert to Windows 98, and he couldn't stand, the, the conversion didn't work, so he just threw out the computer. And that's how I knew what software it was on it. And my, my Office Depot slip purchasing the software that was on it, so I would make the computer honest, was April 5, 2000. See, God timed it. And by then, I knew, you know, I was, it was kind of regular. The information, the information, the information. And, of course, the janitor with the computer was definitely high brain out. I do want you to write those web pages because I was going to give them up. But I was going to give them up because it was costing me $1,000 a month on the phone bill. Because in those days, if you composed on web TV, which I was using, um, it was all online. And in those days, local phone costs were really high. And I was thinking, oh, you know, this is, I'm female, I shouldn't do this, and it's costing money, so I'm not going to do this. And I was thinking that to myself before God. And then, of course, you know, on my pastor's birthday in 2000, I think it was his birthday, that's when I ran into Jesus the janitor in the garage who had been holding the very computer for me, so I wouldn't have to spend a $1,000 a month. composing web pages about God. You see, that's how witty this gets. This is some of, as it were, the benefit of the battle for integration. You huff and puff and huff and puff and huff and puff. And for a long time. But baby, once the structure gets built, I wouldn't trade anything for this life I got with him now. And I actually started to have it a long time ago, because I've been talking to God my whole life. But to this, the the the, the blowback now, the feedback now, I, I wouldn't give up. I wouldn't give it up for anything. There's no amount of money that's worth this. Okay, just none. And am I a better person? No. I'm not better than I was. 20 years ago, if anything, it might be worse. Am I better than all these moral people out there? No. I'm sure they're more moral than me. Do I understand Bible better than they do? Do I understand and know God better than they do? You bet. Did I cause that? No, God did. John 14, 26 will do it to anybody. Why do you think God praised David? David was one spectacular sinner. I hope you figured that out from the story. So, hello, sin doesn't 
mean that you're cut out from the plan of God. You got to use 1 John 1 9. And David talks about how hurt he was when he didn't. Of course, in those days, it just you put your hand on the animal, you name your sin while the priest slit the throat of the animal. That was their version of using 1 John 1 9. They had to use animals to do it. Although, maybe not always, because in Psalm 32 5, what was it? In Psalm 66 18, there's an implication, it seems, that even if you're not near an animal, so you can't go to the priest, just name your sin to God and take the animal later, I guess. You know, I have to research that more. Could you just name your sin to God and be forgiven, even in the Old Testament? Or was that something, yes, you could do it, but it was a stopgap measure and you'd still have to take the animal in? I'd have to I'd have to research that. But see this is the point. You got this really great back and forth intimate relationship with God and it amazes me that he's not like disgusted. Why isn't he disgusted with me? Why would he want to have a relationship with me? But clearly he does. And clearly it's not because there's something good about me. So clearly he likes the process. And it doesn't matter what I am. I say yes, he wants it to happen. I say yes, he wants the process to happen. He makes the offer, waits for me to say yes, because that's his condition that he created. I say yes, and it doesn't matter what I am. It matters that I said yes because that's the rule, the condition he created. Do you know the Calvinists don't understand that? They don't understand that the gospel is a rule. Believe in my son to be saved. That's a rule God created. It doesn't matter who accepts it. it. doesn't matter who believes in it. Whosoever believes is saved. John 3, 16, X, what was it? 16... 31 and 412. It's a rule. God created the rule. Whosoever believes is saved. Calvin was all tied up in knots about that. Oh, well, he must, he must, um, he must just elect you blindfolded, you know, like throwing darts. And, um, he, he he blinds himself to his foreknowledge about who you are and then just, you know, throws darts and if John Doe is one of the darts, well, then you get saved. And, of course, really, you believe afterwards only because you got, you, you well, see, it's actually, well, what, um, well, see, God, God's foreknowledge, he sort of blinds himself, he throws a dart, and whoever's name is on there, then, then that's the person he elected. And because you got elected, now you're able to believe, and you got regenerated before you, well, yeah, yeah you got regenerated before you, you see how tangled this is? He reverses Titus 3 5, doesn't understand about 1 John 2 2, or else it was Beza that did it. We don't know if it was Calvin or Beza for sure. Craziness. And they've been wacko ever since. God made a rule. You believe in my son, you're saved. Whosoever believes, that's a rule. Now, you as a ruler are going to be making a lot of rules over your kingdom. And you're going to be making love to them too. So now your experience with God down here, vertically him making love to you by means of him putting his word in you. <laughs> and that's exactly what Paul and James are talking about. <laughs> Because Paul uses pleroo, which means to fill up a f ship with car with cargo or a woman with, you know, pregnancy. <laughs> and then James uses the same thing when he says implanted word. And what was that in James one twenty one or thereabouts? You, you understand what implanted is. And of course, Christ himself made that analogy when he's talking about the field and seed. 
and everybody's all thinking agriculture. Yeah, but it has this other meaning. Hello? And he prayed for the oneness in John 17. Hello? We're called bride of Christ. What do you think that means? And then, of course, Paul uses sumar, sunarmologeo, and sumbibadzo. Both are sexual verbs for what the man does to the woman on her wedding night. I got that in Thayer's lexicon. Paul did that in Ephesians 4.16 for what the pastor does to the congregation. Pastors playing the role of Christ, husbanding the crop. Ha ha! So you get to do that to your kingdom. What God is doing to you now, and the pleasure of getting finally to the place you know, because the woman has to learn to make love. The man is supposed to teach her how. Of course, he's supposed to be a virgin, and she's supposed to be a virgin, so they're both really learning together. And it's their special, exclusive thing between the two of them. Well, you got that experience with God now. Exclusive him, exclusive you. Now, the fact that he's got a harem doesn't matter. You are actually grateful for that. Because he's so big and you're so small and you want him to have all the pleasure. And you, it's kind of hard to imagine him getting pleasure from, you know, being with you. But he does. And it is exclusive. It doesn't matter that there are billions of other people on this planet. He didn't love you less because he loves them also. He loves you as much as he loves Christ. Agapaho is the Greek verb and it's all over the Bible. That's the same verb that's used for Christ. Is the same verb that's used for God's love for you. Oh, well, good. So now you get all this marital intercourse with God on a spiritual plane. Your whole life down here. And just like any other marriage, it's got its ups and downs. So your experience of being married to him in your soul via Bible doctrine that accumulates and as it accumulates at some point you get used to knowing he's sending information live real time in your head John 14 26 you know it it's not it's, it's not inchoate anymore it's discrete D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E like concrete, discrete, that kind. And then your whole life changes. Mine did. Anyway, I'm in the same sense. Until that April of 98, I was aware of him and I talked to him, but it was kind of like Harvey the White Rabbit. I knew he was real. I knew he heard me. On occasion, I was really sure, with a, you know, no doubt at all, that he meant something, wanted something, etc. But it wasn't frequent. And it was, like I said, more like Harvey the White Rabbit. Somebody you don't really see. And you don't really know he's there. You're living on the idea of God. It's kind of like, I don't know how to put it, like in the Old Testament they have when God visits certain people like, what was it, Gideon and Abraham and Moses. Okay, when you're actually seeing him face to face in those days, it's a, it's a total shock. Remember how Gideon was so shocked and Abraham was so shocked? Okay, but repeatedly repeated 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 iterations of conversation with him you get to the place where like Abraham did <laughs> and Abraham in in Genesis 15 when God appears to him again and says you know you're gonna have kids and Abraham is so used to talking about God he says oh what I'm supposed to have Eliezer of Damascus is my son where's my son that you promised so he talks to him like he knows him. Yeah, well, you get that way with the repetition. 
Okay, what is going to replace that? So you get the repetition, the ups and downs of the marriage. You get all that experience so that when you die, if you mature, then you can make love to your kingdom. So that's a big benefit of the battle for integration. Especially if it's like in the lovemaking. And doesn't that analogy make sense? Huff and puff. And a little whoop at the end. But the meaning is so much more throughout the process. And because of the process. And in the process. I've never heard anybody say that all they want to do with making love is just have that little blip at the end. Almost everybody I've ever heard talk about making love. They love the process. And they like to, like, extend the process. They don't want it to be two seconds and over. They want it to go on all night. All night long. In the Lionel Richie song. Making love all night long. That's, you know, sort of like cultural goal of a lot of people. But then that means they like the process. Talk to God about this. Because, you know, the uptight Christians are going to say, Oh, you shouldn't be talking about sex. Well, but God invented it, honey. Why did he invent it? What is sex but a battle of integration? So then why did God invent sex? To depict the intended relationship to creation. As my pastor liked to put it, a vacation in marriage from your daily life. Well, so then can't every day be turned into a vacation with God in your daily life? 